Amen. To God be the glory. Once again, humble just to be before you. We're going to open our Bibles to the book of St. Matthew today. We're going to see where the Lord take us. We thank God for an opportunity to be in this house for the first time in 2024. Amen. On a Sunday, that is. Amen. Thank God we had a very beautiful watch night service. service Friday night was good as well. Amen. It was good being able to watch it at home. I know it had to be amazing being in the house. God really used Elder Calvin on Friday evening. There's nothing wrong, the Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due and tribute unto whom tribute. We encourage one another, we strengthen one another, iron sharpens iron. Unlike what Cain said, we are our brother's keeper. And as the body of Christ, whether brother or sister, God has allowed us to come together to watch over each other, to help each other, to encourage one another. When's the last time you encouraged someone? All the amens got silent there. It's necessary, but who's us to be able to say a kind word, to encourage somebody? You never know what people are going through. Sometimes we look at things based on the outward appearance and say, oh, well, they have it all together. It's not always the case. You know, some of us know how to put on our game face. You could be going through all kind of war and havoc in your life. But nevertheless, optimistically, as the Bible said, we have to call those things that are not as though they were as they though they were. So therefore, we don't allow the circumstance to dictate our praise. We don't allow the situation to dictate our hallelujahs. But we come boldly before the throne of grace and before the brothers and sisters. And what we find is that our lifestyle in itself becomes a testimony for someone. That when they hear the report later, they say, I did not even know you were going through that. You didn't even say anything. You didn't even look like you were going through anything. Well, I haven't read in the Bible anywhere I'm supposed to look like I'm going through. No, but I have to look to the hill from which cometh my help. And because I know my help is on the way, although the help may not have arrived yet, but because I know it's on the way. That puts a smile on my face. It lifts me up in my spirit. Give me joy that is unspeakable, a joy that the world itself cannot take away. Because I know what I'm going through is only for a season, for a moment, and cannot even be compared to the weight of glory that is on the way. There's a glory on the way. For that reason, I can testify and tell somebody it's going to be all right. You woke up this morning. You got another opportunity. You got another chance to correct whatever mistakes were there. Another opportunity to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Another opportunity to say, Father, forgive me. Another opportunity to say, I'm going to be better today than what I was yesterday. And Lord, I'm able to do it because of your strength. You know, God is no respecter of persons. It don't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter, you know, if you've been saved 40 years or if you've been saved five minutes. Guess what? God still care for you. Somebody said there's a blessing somewhere with my name on it. Well, I haven't read it that way, but I accept it. Sounds good in my belly. The scripture says in the book of St. Matthew, we see Jesus, Jesus ministering and teaching. We thank God for all the scriptures, but there's nothing like listening to the words from Jesus himself. We know Jesus said he didn't come to condemn the law, but the law through him might be, be fulfilled. It comes to manifestation, comes to fruition. 
And what we see here that Jesus began to instruct his apostles and teach them. He deals with the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, the right attitude to be in. Then he gets to a point in the seventh chapter of Matthew around the seventh verse where he encourages them to pray. We spoke on praying on last week, how it's written men should always pray and not to what? Pray. And not to faint. That we shouldn't get weary in our well-doing. Don't you know when you're doing God's work, that is a well-doing. But he says when you're praying, you ought to ask. And then what happens? He said it shall be given you. He didn't say it might be given you, but it shall be given if you ask. But when you ask, don't ask amiss. Don't ask with evil intentions. But when you ask, ask in sincerity and believing, faith unfeigned. The word says when you ask, it shall be given. So there ought to be a level of expectation and anticipation that when I ask God for something, that it's just a matter of time when God says, here it is. The Bible says not only if you ask, it shall be given, but you can seek. If you got to seek for it, that means something is no longer within view that you have to make an effort to go and find and to search out. And in the process of you searching and seeking and looking, what happens, it shall be revealed. But the Bible says you shall find it. Once again, I'm looking at these words, you shall be given to you, you shall find. It's not by happenstance. It's not nothing for you to have a lack of faith and be hesitant, wondering whether or not God's going to perform what he said he would do. The word allows us to see it, that if God says it, it shall happen. It's one thing if this were the words of men, but these are words of Jesus himself. Then he said there's a time when you can just knock on the door and it shall be open unto you. Go bang on the door, knock on the door persistently knowing that if I knock long enough that at some point God is going to open it up. Even if Satan himself try to shut certain doors, don't you know if God opened a the door, there's nothing that Satan can do about it. There were some doors people said you should have never been walking through. But then I say thank God that I didn't have to just rely on your words or your lack of vision or your lack of understanding. Because I know that when I put confidence in God, I don't care if there was a padlock on the door. If God said it's going to open, I'm just waiting for it to open. But many times we get discouraged because it don't happen in the season that we want it to happen. It goes back to what we spoke on about Kairos in God's timing. Wait. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And what will it do? Look at that. The strength that will come if you'll wait. The Bible said, let patience have her perfect work. But patience move too slow. Patience want to take her time. But the Bible said, let her have her perfect work. And you'll find that you won't be wanting for anything, but you'll find yourself being in a place where you are complete and you are entire. Some things that God would have blessed us with if it was in our season and timing, the thing that was a blessing could have destroyed us. Somebody don't believe that. There's some people who God have blessed in this season, this hour, where they might be blessed even in the financial sense. But if they had that financial blessing 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they may not be living today because they might have bought too many drugs. Maybe the potency of the kind of drugs they would have purchased would have killed them. And they would have never gotten to this point. Or maybe they were on the other end of the spectrum where they weren't the one abusing the drugs, but they were the dope dealer. But now it put that person in a situation where now they're dealing with folk on a different level where it put their life at jeopardy when deals go bad. 
Many times we don't think about God's timing when he moves, but we get discouraged in our spirit and say, Lord, why I got to go through all of this? And just say, saying, Lord, I thank you. Because you know, and your knowledge is go way beyond my comprehension. But I trusted God. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, he says, ask it shall be given, seek you shall find, knock, and it shall be open unto you. And I think about that knock and there are times where you go knocking on people's houses and they won't open the door. Happened this past week. Guy had double parked down my street, right in front of my driveway. Couldn't get out. I went to the door and I'm banging on the door. They said, Bishop, you don't do that in New York. Well, you do what you have to do. <laughs> but the thing about it, the guy didn't come to the door. I went, banged again. Doom, 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 doom. The third round was like the police knocking on the door. The guy still didn't open the door. I said, now, I know this Negro was in there. <laughs> but nevertheless, the door went open. But see, God is not like man. When you are persistent with God, what happens, you will find that he will show up. Anybody ever tried it? That you begin to pray, and you didn't just stop when he didn't move right away, but you kept praying about it. You kept going to the altar about it. You put your name on about three sheets of paper, roll it up and put it in their prayer bowl. Say, God, you got to hear me. And it would happen. Then he manifests himself unto you. Persistence. But yet, Jesus is speaking unto his apostles, his disciples, and those that are around. And he says in verse 9, Oh, what man is there of you, of whom if he asked his son bread, would he give him a stone? God's reasoning within himself said, No, my father wouldn't give me no stone if I asked for bread. If I asked for a fish, he wouldn't give me a serpent. Then Jesus said, well, then, if you being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more would your heavenly Father do what? Give good things to them that ask of him. In one gospel, it says that he would give not just simply a good thing or good things, but yet he said if he would ask, he would give him the Holy Ghost. The spirit of truth, the comforter. There's no better gift that one can receive in the realm of this world than the Holy Ghost. Because when you receive the spirit of God, it brings you into fellowship with God. It brings you at one with God. It gives you benefits. If you ever had a job before, you know what benefits are. You got to say that some people love unemployment. But benefits come with employment. Health plans. Retirement plans. But you got to stay at the job longer than six months to get those plans in effect. I've seen guys that are teenagers, 19, 20. They work more jobs than I did in my whole life. Every two or three months, they change it from one job unto the next job. Then you ain't even had an opportunity to take advantage of any benefits. Now, I better leave it alone. The Bible says, if a man don't work, he don't eat. Work while it's yet day, for when the night come. All through the scripture, if a man can't take care of his own house, he's worse than what? That's an unbeliever. How can I be a, a saint? How can I be filled with God's spirit? And I'm doing worse than the unbeliever when you can't take care of your house. That was a commercial. The scripture here is saying that how the Lord, he knows how to meet needs and he will meet your needs. But he says in verse 12, 
Therefore, all things, whatsoever ye would, that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Whatever you would want done unto you, whatever kind gestures you would like to be done unto you, then you too also need to reciprocate that unto other people. Many times when we come to dealing with people, the first thing we think about is, well, have they done me right? Or we think about how they've done us wrong. And then we try to use this as an occasion to exercise a type of revenge. But the Bible said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I shall repay. We don't measure how we deal with people based on how they deal with us. If they smite me on one cheek, I give them the other one also. That's what it means to be a Christian. But I know churchgoers a lot of times don't want to be Christians. We want to look the part. We want to sound the part. But the execution of the nature seem to be far from us. But you don't know what they said about me. You don't know what they did to me. They killed my dog and my cat. But go buy them a dog and a cat. What? That's not getting even. God didn't tell you to get even. But what happens when you're done wrong? Reward them with kindness. The scripture speaks of that. It's like heaping hot coals on their head. Have you ever been in an argument and disagreement with someone and they were just so mad and then you and you just smiling at them? And what that do? It make them hotter, don't it? Start seeing the steam come off of them. Their hair once was straight, now it's curling up. What am I talking about? Once again, knowing how when we walk in the gospel, how we walk in the instructions that Jesus has manifested and have imparted unto us, then we'll see a peaceable fruit come about that even mess the enemy up. How can they be at peace? How is it that they can still walk according to this word? What's wrong with them? But yet, it's an elevation that we see taking place. In doing so, the Bible says in verse 13, then we're on that narrow path. Why is it a narrow path? Because there don't be too many people on that path. It's a straight, narrow path as if it's been compressed. In other words, as if there's been pressure on the walls that narrows the path. And many people don't know how to walk with this pressure. Many people don't understand that it's only through pressure that coal becomes a diamond. They don't understand that it's only through pressure that you change from one rim or from one element to another. Yes. Mother Bryant would always say, if it don't break you, it'll make you. How many of you believe that? Sometimes we have to have the mindset of saying, I invite the pressures of life. Not that I go looking for it, but I'm not running from it. Many times when opposition comes, the first thing we want to do, we want to run. Get out of there. But yet, what we understand is that if I go through the fire, because I realize there are some tests that God has placed before me, and if I go through the fire, if I pass the test, I get to graduate. But now, if I like being in the fifth grade, and I don't want to go no further than that, well, that's your prerogative. But as men and women of God, we should have a desire to be all that God desires us to be. Whatever it is, God, that you have chosen purpose to take place in this life, in this mortal body, my desire is that it be executed. But there's a way that seemeth right to a man. 
And the Bible said the end thereof is death. Jesus says, straight and narrow, the straight gate. For there is a wide gate, and it's broad in that way, but it leads to a path of destruction, annihilation. But it's not his desire that we suffer a demise and find ourselves falling from grace. Finding ourselves in an apostate place. We see the church where it seems that the love of many have waxed cold and there is this falling away that's taking place. It should not be. But people are getting weak. They're getting weary. You know, if you don't eat properly, your body will begin to faint. They have a saying in the world, you are what you eat. Many people don't want to eat a well-balanced meal. But it's through eating the well-balanced meal, your body gets the strength and the nurturement and the nutrients that it needs. I say this as a type of allegory because of the fact that when we abide in God's word, when we eat of the word of God, we eat of the spirit of truth, we'll find ourselves finally in a balanced situation. But when you deviate from the truth and begin to pursue fairy tales, when you deviate the truth and find yourself falling out the theatric, when you deviate the truth and get caught up in emotionalism, then what happens when the storm of life comes? You don't have nothing to sustain you. Hide yourself in the pages and the folds of the scripture. Let the word of God be engrafted in your belly. That it's as much a part of you as the blood that flows through your body. That when you're cut in the natural, the blood is released and flow. When you cut me in the spiritual, the word of God step out and say, we're here and ready to handle it. Because the word is alive. In him I move and I have my being. Spend time with him more than you do with the edifice. Somebody said, what? You spending time with the edifice doesn't replace the time that you're supposed to spend with the word. I'm there every time the door is open. But what about this? How often you open this? Eat. And your soul shall live. The writer said, taste and see how good the Lord is. He told us he could eat the whole roll. Eat. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, the Bible said, you shall be filled. What are you filled with? What have you been eating? Whose table you been sitting at? Everybody got their belly sticking out don't mean they full. The children in third world countries, the bellies are poked out because of malnutrition. Therefore, our discernment has to be elevated. And this year, your discernment needs to be sharper than it's ever been. Jesus tells us as we transfer and move down and transition into the next couple of verses, you'll see where he begins to give us warning concerning those that have the appearance of righteousness. They look like they would be righteous. They have the office, and in the office, they should have the anointing, but they don't. Let's look at this word. He says in verse 15, beware of false prophets. False prophets? What is Jesus talking about? This is one of his first sermons, and he's talking about beware of false prophets. 
Beware of false teachers, false ministers. Beware because they have sheep clothing. They look the part. If your discernment is turned off, you will not realize it. You say, no, that's a man of God. That's a woman of God. Anybody from my generation or older, you remember the old cartoons they have? And they would show the sheep pasture. But there was one sheep that looked a little different from the others. The top part looked like a sheep. But underneath he had these little legs. And it didn't look like the sheep legs. The drool coming off the fangs of his mouth. He camouflaged himself to look like the sheep because he said, now it's supper time. If he went in and said, hey, everybody, the Mr. Big Bad Wolf is here, then all the sheep would have ran out. But he said, but if I would camouflage myself and mix myself in with the herd, they will not know, and I can take them out one by one, one at a time, and then one day, one of the intelligent sheep will start counting. Wait a minute. We missing some folk. What happened? It's the wolf. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are raving wolves. Paul said it something like this. He said that there were those that was waiting for his departing. And they would come in as ravenous wolves, not sparing the flock. Jesus talked about how when you had those who were not as himself as the good shepherd, he called them hirelings. People who just were paid to do a job and they would only do what they were paid to do. But at the end of the day, if they felt their life was threatened because the wolf come into the pasture, the hireling and said, well, I got to go. This is not in my job description. I got to protect me. The hireling says self-preservation is the first law of nature. But the person who's the good shepherd, he said, no, I must lay my life down for the sheep. If it means I got to do warfare. Spiritual warfare, I don't mind because for this reason I was called. If you ask me, the hireling and the wolf, they are in cahoots with one another. They go in the back room, say, all right, my man, did your job. Let me hit you off. What am I talking about? In this day and time, if you're not careful and your discernment is not sharp, you'll find where many will walk after these pernicious ways. The Bible talk about scoffers in those days. They come preaching damnable heresies. That word heresies is false teaching. It looked like Hershey's, but it's not nothing sweet. Heresies will kill you. It will destroy you. And if you're not able to tell the difference, what is heresy and what is truth, then you set yourself up for annihilation. You got to know him. Be able to recognize what's truth. Everything that tickle your ear is not truth. Amen. But where many of us get caught up and hung up, I went to the prophet and they told me that I was going to get that husband. <laughs> they said 2024 is my year. And I went on Facebook and I did the little thing and, and it said, this is your year. So Lord, you said two or three witnesses. See how saint justify mess? That's exactly what I said, mess. The 
Bible tell us as men, if a man go find a wife, he found a good thing. I don't need nobody to prophesy to me to go and marry so-and-so. No, that's not your place. Just preach the word. But what happened, we have gotten to a point where we look to men and women of God to orchestrate every movement in our life instead of going to God for yourself and say, Lord, what do I do? Well, pastor said I'm not supposed to take this job. Pastor said I'm not supposed to marry this one. Pastor said I'm supposed to do this. Pastor said, what did God say? What are the pastors of Harlem? What are the pastors in cahoots with the adversary, the wolf? Saying I got them right where I want them. Now let me elevate it a little bit. You know what? God is telling me to tell you I need you to sow $1,000 a day. This is what preachers are doing all across the world. $10 prayer lines, $50 prayer line, $100 prayer lines. You're telling me that if I got on a $100 prayer line, God's going to do something different than he would if I only had $5? I, I just don't understand this. When did the church start paying indulgences? This is not wrong. Jesus warns them concerning false seers. This is nothing new. It happened even in the Old Testament. We've seen too many times in the Old Testament. The Bible reminds me of a situation where Jehoshaphat, he wanted to form an allegiance with Ahab. Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah and Ahab the king of Israel. I don't think Jehoshaphat really knew that Ahab was as wicked as he was. This is a man who took another man's vineyard. He said, man, I like that vineyard he got over there. Was it Naboth? He said, man, he got a nice vineyard and it's so close to my palace. I want that vineyard for myself. Wait a minute, you're the king of God's people, and instead of being content with what you already have and how God has already allowed you to receive these things, you're out there trying to take what little somebody else got. Sad that when you got kings that were supposed to be under God's reign, when you got priests and prophets that are supposed to be under God's reign, taking advantage of the flock of God. So he goes to the neighbor and said, look, let me have this vineyard and I'll give you one even better. If it's better than this, then why don't you get that one? I'm sorry, that's not in our translation of scripture here. Well, what if I give you some money for I'll give you more than what it's worth? I don't want your money either. The Lord won't allow me to give this up. This is my heritage. This is my inheritance. My forefathers worked for this land. It was given unto them. I can't give it to you, king. The Bible said Ahab went away pouting, mad, like a little baby, curled up. And just said, what's wrong, honey? He won't give me the vineyard. Aren't you the king? If you're the king, take what you want to take. Matter of fact, I got a better plan. I know some sons of Bilal. And what we're going to do, we're going to have him killed. And you can take all you want. The wickedness of those in leadership. But yet, you got Jehoshaphat, who's a righteous king. The Bible says, talking about the origin of Jehoshaphat, said that how he walked in the ways, of the early ways of David. <laughs> That's how the scripture works. The early days of David. Once again, implying how we can start off right and somehow we stumble along the way. But the Bible says there came a day that Jehoshaphat would form an allegiance with Ahab. 
And now that Ahab felt like he got reinforcements, he wanted to go to war at Ramoth Gilead. And in the process of going to war, Jehoshaphat said, look, my people are as your people. We're going to be one because two can't walk together except they agree. But before we go into battle, can we get a word from the Lord? See, what happened? Jehoshaphat didn't quite discern Ahab. He really didn't know who Ahab really was. But yet, he formed an allegiance with the lack of knowledge. Who are you forming allegiance with because you think they're one thing to find out there's something else? What you do in the dark will come to light. What we understood because of what Ahab had permitted his wife to do with Naboth. There was a declaration or a word spoken on his demise. So now that he's at a point where he wants to go to war, because what happened, you'll find that many times misery loves company. He don't want to go in by himself. He wants to have an allegiance with someone. But what we fail to realize that those who are so quick to form bonds and allegiance with us, what kind of hell are they trying to bring us into? So what kind of message is this for the first Sunday of the new year? Your discernment got to be sharp. So then what happened, Ahab was trying to prove how religious he was. I got all of these prophets here. They're going to prophesy. Maybe we ought to turn it in the scripture. Is that okay? Yeah. It's in Chronicles and in Kings. But let's go to Chronicles. I believe it's Chronicles I want to go to. Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 18. If I was in any other church, I have to say that's in the Old Testament. All right, it's not near 2 Corinthians. We got to go back. The old school part of the Bible. All right, 2 Chronicles chapter 18. And the Bible says around verse 4. Of the 18th chapter. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Therefore, the king of Israel gathered together of prophets 400 men. 400 men, look at that. That's got to be impressive. You got 400 prophets. Hmm, interesting. Jesus says, Beware of the false prophets, and this man got 400 prophets. The word says, the 400 men, and said unto them, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? What did these prophets have to say? They said, go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. You mean all 400 of you all agree? I guarantee you, if we had a minister's meeting right now, I couldn't get all of us to agree on, on a particular item. There'll be a portion that said we're gonna, we think it should be this way. Another portion said we think it should be that way. It's nothing negative about it. It's all right to have difference of opinion. But you got 400 men to agree? Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord? Besides these, basically, that we might inquire, out of these 400 prophets and they all in agreement, is there not one here? That can hear from God? Is there not one here that will speak the truth and not just tell the king what he wanted? Is there not one here that is a member of the household of God? He discerned that. Why is it he couldn't discern the king? Verse 7, and the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Yeah, there is yet one. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> this is interesting. There's one man. He don't even acknowledge him as a prophet. He said, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. <laughs> He's not likable. He's not like the 400. <laughs> no, he want to be a maverick. He want to stand out from the crowd. I hate him. 
I wonder why you hate him. Well, in the scripture it says, for he never prophesied good unto me. Wait a minute. You hate the man because he tell you the truth? Even if the truth isn't sound like it's good, but you hate him because he has principles and integrity and he fears God where he will not lie on God but tell you the truth. You would rather believe false prophets that will lead you to your demise because they tickle your ear. They are folk right now that will abandon a ministry that's speaking truth to cling to a place that's going to tell them what they want to hear. Even if it means entangling them in wars, they should have never been participating in and losing their lives. He never tell me what I want. I can't stand that rascal. Scripture says, hey, that's a strong word. He says that I hate him. He never prophesied good, but always evil. The same as Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. If this is one that came from the Lord, let not the king say these things. Touch not my anointed, do my prophet no harm. If this is indeed a prophet of God, watch what you say, because what means that you may place your judgment on him, it'll come back on you. People are dealing with manners of illness and infirmities a lot of time because they spoke evil on those servants of the Most High God. And as a result of that, that came upon their own lives. He didn't say just the prophets. He said, touch not my anointed, do my prophet. When you have the Holy Ghost, you're anointed. You're anointed. No, I, I, I didn't say nothing about the preacher or the pastor. I was talking about so, but they got the Holy Ghost. They anointed. Yeah. You don't believe it? Go and read 1 John around the third and fourth chapter. That anointing talking about the spirit of God that's upon them. Watch how we put our mouth on things and people. The word says here. Verse 8, when the king of Israel called for one of his officers and said, go fetch him. Like, he a dog. Go fetch him. Quickly. Bring him here. What we find out is that when you get down here to verse 11, saying all the prophets prophesied so. Once again, rehearsing and reiterating what the other prophets said. Go up to Ramoth Gilead and you're going to prosper. They had prosperity gospels and doctrines back then. For the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And look what the messenger says in verse 12. And the messenger that went to call Micaiah spake to him saying, Behold, the words of the prophets declare good to the king with one assent. Let thy word, therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs and speak thou good. The messenger is telling Micaiah, the prophet of God, the one prophet of God out of all of those false prophets, he's trying to tell him, let your word be just like this. I'm warning you, say the same thing they're saying. Let it be pleasing to the king. And Micaiah, a man of principle and integrity, he said, as the Lord liveth, even what my God said, that will I speak. I can only testify, speak, and preach what I've seen and what I've heard. I can't add to it. I can't take away from it. The scripture says concerning the book of Revelation, those that add to the words of this prophecy, to them shall be added the plagues that are written in that prophecy. Those that take away from the words of that prophecy, 
then their name shall also be taken away out of the book of life. Don't add to God's word. We don't take away from God's word. When God says something, he means it. As ministers and oracles of the Bible, of the scripture, and the gospel, of the words from the kingdom, we have a mandate and a charge that we walk circumspectly, humbling ourselves, not trying to satisfy people, but speak the truth in season and out of season, whether they hear, whether they forbear, speak the truth because the truth is going to save somebody. That's the purpose of our propagation. That people can come to salvation. The Bible says that after Micaiah said these things, and when he was come to the king, oh, it's about to go down. Somebody would say, watch this, watch this, watch this. Somebody might say, get ready, get ready, get ready. It's about to go down. The word says here that when he came to the king, the king said unto him, oh, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall I forbear? And he said, hey, go ye up and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. And then the king, oh, okay, yeah, all right. He's on board now. And he said to him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou say nothing but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? But wait, 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 wait. I'm not done. <laughs> Got a little something else to say to you, old king. The king said unto him, what? Look at verse 16. Then he said, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd, as sheep even without a hireling, as a sheep without the one who is being moved by the directions of the adversary, the wolf. A sheep that was scattered. Why? Because when you smite the shepherd, what happened? He says, and the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return, therefore, every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would not prophesy good unto me, but only prophesy and speak evil unto me? Got mad with the man of God for speaking the truth. Rather, follow the tune of the Pied Piper and the false prophets. Again, he said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. And now he began to share a vision, a revelation of what God was doing in the heavens. That's amazing. You're standing before one group of people and you're speaking the things of God. And while you're speaking the things of God, it's not as if it was a dark saying when you're trying to figure out God is allowing you to see how everything is playing out in the heavenlies. It's almost as if everything else froze. I like watching, you know, Marvel and X-Men and comics and stuff like that. There's one that's called Professor X. He has the ability to control people's mind. Somebody said, that sounds like witchcraft, Bishop. <laughs> Just follow me for the movie's sake. Yeah, mind control, manipulation. I know, I know. But just follow me for a second. He'll sit in his chair and he'll do this thing here. Everybody will stop and freeze like this. They don't even realize they froze. Because what's happening, what's going on in his case, it was mental, but in this case with Makai, it was spiritual. It's like everything just took a pause, and he's having this revel. He's seen the whole host of heaven around the throne of God, and God is revealing mystery. These are mysteries we don't even really speak too much about. Look at what the word says here. And he says, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne. Starts off almost kind of like Isaiah would say in the year that King Uzziah died. 
And he said, and all the hosts of heaven standing on the right and on the left hand of God. And the Lord said, who shall entice Ahab, the king? Of God had already a plan bringing Ahab to a demise because he remember how he stole the vineyard. And then what happened? One spirit would come, another spirit would come before God. And what do they say here when he asks, who shall entice? It says, and one spake, saying after this man, and another saying, God is taking counsel of a heavenly host. Although he's God and he don't need anybody, but yet we see God in this revelation, this vision that Micaiah is having. He's sitting here and says, I need to entice. How can I go about doing this? And he gives the various ones an opportunity to speak their peace. And then another says, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? Verse 21. And he said, I will go out and be in a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Don't you know? There are men and women in authority in this generation in this day that already have a death sentence but yet because it looked like they're still in position and like they're still governing that we think that everything is fine and dandy they escape the sentence of death to only find out that there is a strategic plan in the heavens and they will eventually come down because there still are those enticing spirits that are speaking through the mouths of those who proclaim to be preachers. Lord, this doesn't sound like the Sunday, but I can't shout on this. The scripture goes on and say, and the Lord said, thou shalt entice them, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord had put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord had spoken evil against the other word. The Lord has already spoken judgment on you. Now, how do you think the king felt about that? Verse 23, and Zedekiah, the son of Shaniah, came near and smote me. He slapped the man of God. I'm going to show you about your visions. Pop! Now, tell me what spirits you see. Y'all think I'm making this up. Let's read and see what happens. He smote him on the cheek and said, Which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? Which way did he go? To the left? To the right? What do you got to say now? Prophet. And the Bible says, and Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see on that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Then the king of Israel said, Take ye Micaiah and carry him back to Amnon, the governor of the city, and to the Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus said the king, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with a bread of affliction. And with water of affliction until I return in peace. The man of God still did not hold his peace. Well, if thou certainly return in peace, then have not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, hearken all ye people. Listen to what the king said. Do you think the king made it back? Nope. He died in battle, although he tried to hide himself. Even as the man of God spake it. He tried to conceal himself, but yet his life was slain. But God spared Jehoshaphat because Jehoshaphat began to cry out unto God. Sometimes we make bad decisions, connect with the wrong folk. But when God reveals his truth and you trust God, God still knows how to pull you out of that mess. 
He still know how to give you a hand. He still know how to bring you back to shore. He still know how to give you a safety net. He still know how to bring you back into his arm and to fellowship. Just because it seemed like you're in a rut that's inescapable, don't believe that hype. God, I still got plans for you. But you shouldn't make that mistake again. Even to the point the next time when he finds himself dealing with warfare, he take heed to the man of God, talking about Jehoshaphat. Because now he heard there's going to be an ambushment coming against him. Three nations, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, surrounding him and saying, Lord, what are we going to do? Because they outnumber us, and I don't have no one else here as an allegiance. As wicked as Ahab was, we don't have Israel here fighting with us. What are we to do? But the Bible says they were given the instruction to pray. Go into praise. So what he did, he didn't go and look for more soldiers with swords and weapons. He went and found singers. Who finds singers? We're in warfare. We're, we're already outnumbered. And it's like we're outmatched. And you want to go find somebody who can sing? Uh, man, we going everywhere we post. But well, let's, let's go in the scripture and see if we can find this here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Kings, 2 Chronicles 20. Thank you. See the advantage of going to Sunday school? Over here in the 20th chapter. And, and, and let's go down here. Verse 18. Thank you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they fell before the Lord. What did they do? In the midst of war, you worship it? In the midst of war, you're falling to the ground? In the midst of the war? I always have to be careful when I say this. I don't say the wrong thing. Because prostate and prostrate sound so much alike. <laughs> Lay prostrate on the ground. In the midst of warfare. Under attack under siege and the Bible says that they begin to worship and the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korhites all these ites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a what loud voice on high they understood what Jesus was speaking about when he told him, knock and the door shall be open. Seek and you shall find and call upon him. The word said in verse 20, and they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in who? He didn't say put your trust in the prophets. That is the false prophets. Because the prophets of the Lord, there's nothing wrong with them. But he says, hear ye, O Jerusalem and Judah. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye believe and be established and believe whose prophets? His prophets, not the false ones. So ye shall do what? Prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. And that they should praise in the beauty of holiness. Don't that sound beautiful? And they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy and do it forever. They went out as an army before the armies that were around them. And they said, praise be to the Lord in the beauty of all, in spirit and in truth, worshiping and showing adoration and homage unto the living God. Saying, your mercy Endure for it. In spite of what it looked like, God, your mercy endured. In spite of the enemy, your mercy endured. In spite of the warfare, your mercy is able to carry us through this. 
Mercy brought you through 20 and 23. Mercy's going to carry you through 20 and 24. Blessed be the name of God. He reigns. He rules. His kingdom's from everlasting to everlasting. He is the king of glory. The Lord of hosts is his name. When you have such a revelation, you are fit for battle. When you have such an understanding, you're not afraid and walking in fear, but you're able to stand face to face with the adversary. Say, I shall live and not die. I shall be victorious and not defeated. I'm a conqueror and more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus that live in me. The Bible says in verse 21, after he consulted with them and they began to go forth in praise. Verse 22 says, and when they begun to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the adversary. Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they, were, they began to destroy one another. Caught up in one another's crossfire. Can you imagine, you know, here you are, Jehoshaphat and all of Judah, and y'all right here in the middle, and you got Ammon on this side, Moab on that side, Mount Seir, and they crossing over, annihilating each other. And you're there praising God, and you're singing, oh, happy day. Don't wait for the battle's over. Shout now. You're giving God praise and victory, not for just what he's already done, but for what he is. I've accepted my victory. I accepted the fact that we've won the battle already. I've accepted the fact that we're going to win the war. I've accepted the fact because God's got a plan for us. And there's no weapon that's formed against you that can prosper. The infirmity tried to take you out, but you're still here. They might have to take organs out your body, but you're still here. I'm telling you, they tried everything that was in the book, but yet God said, you shall live. Because somebody needs your testimony. Somebody needs to hear that I still say. Somebody needs to hear the voice of a true man and woman of God and not false prophets. Testify what he's done. Don't be ashamed of your testimony. But learn to just give God the praise, the glory, and exalt in spite of. I know somebody want to praise him right now. It's okay. Take your praise break. It's all right to give him glory. They didn't have to wait for a prayer line. It was through their singing. It was through their praise. It was through their worship that God gave them the deliverance. When you are bound, when you look like you are under attack, to be set free from that is to be delivered. That deliverance came about because of personal relationships personal relationships with the father and following the instructions of the leader and God blessed them he brought them out and placed their feet on a solid ground God's favor somebody said it's not fair God's mercy that endure from everlasting to everlasting, that's renewed each and every, God's grace. Whatever it is you're going through, you don't have to run looking for no other prophecies. The word of God draweth nigh unto thee. If you'll just accept that word and consume that word, and you will find what you're looking for. Those voids that were there will no longer be there. The reservation, the doubt. Lord, is this really what I'm supposed to do? 
I'm not sure about this, God. I, I was satisfied where I was. I like the music over there a little better. I like the preaching over there a little better. Why did you have me come here? Why? Why? There's a reason. It's not by accident. It's not by coincidence. He may have allowed you to be there for a season because there was something you needed at that time. But what he's about to do with you at this point, it requires a different level of education. You're here to be further equipped. This has nothing to do with you trying to abolish what you already knew. No, that was a good foundation, but now there is more that God wants to do, and he has you here for that reason, because there's something in you that needs to be stirred up. You can't lay dormant this year. You can't sit on the gift this year. You can't sit on the ability that God has given you. You got to occupy until he comes. We're going to show you how to ignite that thing. So you can be busy about the Father's business. And through it all, you'll understand the humility that it's not that you be seen of men. But whatever God do through your life, you can say, it was God. God did that. God who's faithful, who is true, who's wonderful, counselor, mighty God, the Prince of Peace, Jehovah Jireh, everything I need him to be. The bishop of my soul. I don't care if you go tell somebody you got a new bishop. Tell him it's Jesus. He's the bishop of your souls. He's the good shepherd. He's the pastor. You are the sheep. We are just fellow servants doing what thus saith the Lord. We don't want your pocketbooks. We want you. Be encouraged. Satan tried to take many of you out because he didn't want you to come to this climax in which God is going to execute the works through you. But somehow or another, we were able to escape out of the tricks and snares. The day's going to come, Satan's going to be like, I should have tried a little harder. You are a threat to the adversary's kingdom. Don't never forget that. Don't let him tell you you're nobody. Don't let him tell you that you don't have no anointing. Don't let him tell you you ain't saved. Don't have him have you question who you are in God. Let him know I'm a threat and you might as well get used to it. God put me on the offensive side, not on the defensive side. The kingdom of heaven suffer violence. The Bible says the violence. Take it. Do we have anybody that's ready to take it by force? Are you soldiers in God's army? You ready to go to warfare? Let's see if we can do like Judah and give God some praise and give God some glory. Give God some glory, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You have no need to fight in this battle. I'll do the fighting, said the Lord. But give me worship. Worship him. Glory to your name, Father. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Jesus. Jesus. The Prince of Peace. The Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley. The Ancient of Days. I am that I am, my Lord, my Savior, my help in the time of need, my strong tower, my healing, my refuge, my help, Jesus, my help, my paraclete, my friend, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. So let it be done.
Your journey begins here with BCCTI. Dive into a year of immersive Bible study, uplifting worship, and a thriving community. Here, we'll nurture your faith and equip you to apply it in the world. Expectations are high, and we're eager to witness your path unfold under God's guidance. At BCCTI, excellence is our standard, boasting a wealth of resources in our extensive library. We don't just educate, we create opportunities for you to serve, aligning with your passions and God-given purpose. Don't hesitate, this is the start of an extraordinary adventure. Registration is open, apply now.